Howdy everyone across the internet cyberspace. Thanks for tuning into the Watchbox review today. In today's review, we are taking a close look at my Ingersoll Bison number no. six. So this is the watch you're seeing here on my right wrist. I frequently wear my watches right or left-handed. I switch back and forth all the time. Um, but this is a very wide, flat case-shaped profile, and the geometry fits my wrist bone structure very nicely. So my wrist is a little over seven and a half inches around, and it's about 63, 63 millimeters wide across the bone structure. And a watch like this is very, very comfortable for me. So let's pause it here, turn the camera around, and hammer through the technical specifications. So I've had this watch now for a little over a month, and it's been great. I have no real major complaints about it. Uh, what you're looking at here has this watch has seen its share of scratches, dings, and dents uh, over that time period. So far, it's smacked into a stainless steel shelf, um, a metal doorknob, a wooden doorknob, and a couple car rear view mirrors and you might be seeing some scratches and dents and things, some dings here and there along the way. So I'll talk to those points as well as we go through this. So let's hammer through the technical specifications. What you're looking at is a 52 millimeter wide case diameter from the four o'clock to the 10 o'clock. And the mineral crystal window opening on the front is 45 millimeters across. The overall case thickness Let's see, from the flat of the crystal to the case back is 14.8, about 15, about 15 millimeters. So as I said before, it's a wide, flat case shape profile. It doesn't really sit too far up, too tall up off the wrist, and I find it very comfortable. So uh, the most distinguishing feature probably about it is the canteen crown protector on the side. And you simply, like all other canteen protectors, you simply unscrew it. And there's an o-ring gasket in there to seal out water. And there is the minuscule microscopic crown. One of the, sm the smallest crown I've, I own in my collection. And even smaller than like the Russian Diver, the Invicta Russian Divers, and my Sterling that I have. Maybe you've seen some of my video reviews on those watches. But this crown is dinky and tiny by comparison. So... At any rate, you're going to want to make sure your crown is nice and secure to maintain water resistance. So you just simply thread it on. Don't over tighten it, over torque it. Just give it a gentle, gentle turn, and that's it. That's all you need to do. So out of the box, I did go through and re-tighten uh, some of these screws here. I'm not sure if you can see those. Um, they weren't loose or anything like that, but I just gave them a little torque and a little twist to make sure that they were nice and solid and secure. So... Uh, the strap lug width is a semi-standard 23 millimeters wide, so it wouldn't be too difficult, I don't think, to squeeze in a 24 millimeter strap if it's a soft leather or maybe a soft silicone. Um, the unique thing, one of the unique things about this watch, as you can see here, is it has like a uh, strap, like an end link, a signature, uh, signaturized, I guess, um, black ionic plated uh, end link here. And I kind of wish they did that on both sides. I don't know why they only did it on one side, but they should have done it on both sides. That would have been better looking, I think. Um, as far as the Ingersoll brand, branding as a whole, it's not uh, overly ornate or overly signaturized and decorated. There's the signature signature on the case size side here, but it's really very, very minor and very faint. And same goes for that end link here that you can see. Okay, so the entire case is a brushed stainless finish with a black ionic plating. And as I said before, this case has seen its share of dings and dents along the way. And it's held up very, very nicely. Okay, so let's uh, turn the watch over and take a close look at the movement. So the movement here is a Siegel ST2551 automatic movement. So it's a, it a 21,000 vibration per hour heartbeat that hopefully you can see right there. It's got a fairly nicely decorated wind rotor and ibache as well. 
So there's a lot of watches out there that use this, this movement. Uh, Sterling, I think, uses it, and probably a couple other brands as well. Um, it's a pretty popular um, movement. I don't know what it's based off of, what it's an open-sourced design of or from, but in this case, it's a really, really nice execution. I like how they decorated that rotor, and it looks very, very nice. So, um, One thing about the ST2551 is the wind rotor is kind of, kind of noisy. It's got uh, a series of ball bearings in there that uh, free rotate, but... It is kind of noisy, but don't let that alarm you. There are always there all the all the ones I have in my collection are kind of have that characteristic and that that trait. So, as I said, it is a automatic movement. So just the movement of your wrist will keep the mainspring wound. It is a unidirectional rotating rotor in that sense, in the sense that only a certain rotational direction winds the rotor. It's not a, it's not a bidirectional winding rotor. With that said, I've had no problems with this watch maintaining sufficient. Uh, power reserve. So when I first got it, I gave the crown maybe uh, 10 or 15 turns on the crown, and I just wear it, and I haven't really wound it that much at all. Um, now, as I said earlier, it is a tiny wind crown, winding crown, so it's not really that convenient, to be honest with you, to, to manually wind this watch compared to some of my other manual wind watches. So um, I just simply make my timing adjustments, set my calendar every every other month, and good to go. So um, let's see. Let's take a closer look here into the business end of the watch dial. I hope my iPhone will capture that. A little bit blurry, and for that I apologize. Let's back up just a little bit so you can see that there. So I do not know the luminescent paint used on this watch, but the loom is outstanding, and we'll take a look at that here in a minute. But uh, let's take a closer look at some of the other features. So you have a black on white date wheel there at the three o'clock position and hopefully you can see the smoothness of the sweep second hand. That is one of the outstanding features of this particular movement. Um, it, that second hand is really smooth considering how long the complication is, how long the hand is, um, that 21,000, and it's only 21,600 vibrations per hour, still relatively uniform, relatively smooth for a watch in this, and a movement in this price range. So the crystal is a simple mineral crystal. It does protrude out from the side of the case by just a little bit. And they did a really nice job mirror polishing the edge, uh, the circumference around this crystal. That's one of the really, really nice features about it when you kind of look at it at an angle and it's got, it, looks, it just looks really cool. So it is quote unquote only mineral crystal. It will scratch and I'm hoping you can see that there. I've got a little bit of a scratch on this edge of the crystal because it protrudes just a little bit there. Okay, so the case overall with the canteen cover over the crown, the screw in exhibition case back, the entire watch case, the entire watch is rated for 10 ATMs of water pressure resistance. So being that it's a leather strap, I simply don't wear this watch on the wa in the water. Um, that being said, I'm not really afraid to get it wet or anything like that, but still, it's not really uh, one of the watches I, I'll, I'll take into the water very often, if at all. So um, who knows? That could change. Um, I put on a silicone rubber strap or maybe a Kevlar stitched strap that's that has better water resistance than the leather one, and who knows, I could very easily take it into the water, no problems there. Uh, one of the nice features about the watch overall is I really like the case lug design. How it's, you can't really see that, there you go. It's straight across as opposed to curved, so there's no real gap on well, either side of the watch. There's no real gap condition that exists there. There's a slight gap there, but I could probably fill that gap out near completely with a thicker, an aftermarket, a Panatime or an aftermarket leather strap. Uh, but because there's no curvature there, it fits really, really snug and really nicely. I wish more watch designers designed their watches with that feature in the case lug area. For some reason, everybody curves that surface and it creates a, a couple triangular shaped gaps between the case and the strap. So here is the dual deployant clasp mechanism and it's actually really easy you just simply fold this clasp over here and when you're wearing the watch you simply tuck this strap into the keeper and give it a press and it snaps right in 
it's actually, it's, despite all this material underneath here against your wrist, it's very, very comfortable, very ergonomic. I haven't had any issues with comfort. I wear my watches 24-7 now uh, to sleep, um, awake, wherever. I'm always wearing my watches, and this strap has been really comfortable. So uh, it's fairly stiff. Out of the box, it was really stiff, and it took some, you know, wear and some sweating to get it broken into like a like a brand new baseball glove basically and now that it's broken in it's it's got some nice curvature to it that contours to my wrist and my bone structure very very nicely stitching quality is outstanding not a single frayed end or loose end anywhere along any of the stitching on the strap really really nice I'll probably replace this with an aftermarket strap at some point but honestly I feel no need to do so urgently or right away out of the box it's a really nice strap uh, it's, it's kind of it's it's got some I guess cushioning at the top and it kind of tapers down a little bit so it's really comfortable so the strap as I said before it's a 23 millimeter wide up here and it's got a gradual taper down to like 22 millimeters here at the end very nice um, the keepers here I have some question marks for and some reservations about because they're like a plastic vinyl synthetic material they're not actually leather so I am usually very rough on my strap keepers because they, they rub on the desk when I, when I wear my watches and I'm on my computer or whatever they rub against my desk and tabletop so these are showing some slight signs of wear but again they're kind of a plastic vinyl material so they seem to be holding up very well so a lot of people probably won't like that in fact I bet a lot of you guys would probably prefer a leather strap keeper but but for me hey this is working um, no problems there really so um, let's see let's pause it here and it's kind of bright daylight out but let's pause it here and dim the lights and show you guys the loom so we're back here lights are dimmed and I haven't done this in a long time but I want to do a straight up luminescent comparison between my Ingersoll Bison number six in the middle there and my Seiko Frankenmonster on the right and my Michael Lively Seiko 55 Fathoms on the left. So these two watches on the far right, the far left, represent my best, brightest, longest glowing watches that I own. And for me, the Seiko Frankenmonster is just on the right there is just insanely bright and it's just by far the highest the best luminescent quality I've found for a watch in this price range I mentioned these watches on the left the, again the Seiko 55 Fathoms custom build and the other Seiko there simply because these watches are by far the best glowing watches that I own way better than Invicta way better than like uh, even my my androids uh, which have pretty good loom quality as well for the money um, these watches here are pretty, pretty good, I would say. Uh, very, very good, I would say. So you're seeing here the Ingersoll Bison number 6 doing very, very well compared with the Michael Lively Custom 55 Fathoms build. I believe this watch here uses uh, C3 Super Luminova, but I'm not positive. It's either C2 or C3. I can't remember which one. But definitely, you're seeing these two go head-to-head, -head, toe to toe for what it's worth, all these watches I can read vividly through the night with night-adapted, night-dilated vision. Um, and I think it's a bit surprising, uh, a, lu a luminescent quality level from the Ingersoll, simply because no one really knows about it. I mean, you're on, if I'm, I'm on the watch forums and things of that sort, and Ingersoll is a pretty obscure brand as a whole it's just not really mentioned or talked about a whole lot um, and I'm surprised actually basically I'm surprised if it were another company another brand or whatever they would probably embellish it a lot more on their luminescent quality so they've taken a very low-key approach kind of and Hey, I have no problems with that, you know. I'm so, so that's part of the reason of this review is to get that word out there and say, hey, this one is pretty, pretty good for the money. So speaking on that note, uh, this watch here is about $160 to, to $200. So I guess in summary, all I have to say is this watch really hits on a lot of key points and key factors uh, that I look for in a watch design. So first of all, the luminescent properties are really good. 
um, distinct, clear, easy reading, bold dial fonts. The hands of the watch are very clear and bold against a sea of black, dark um, dial goodness, so to speak. Um, it's kind of weird having a cow's head on my watch. I don't know. It's just strange. <laughs> it's just something you don't see. And so it's like, oh, I guess like Chicago Bulls or whatever kind of a thing. So um, I guess there's a certain coolness factor to it. Um, it's obviously it's styled after like TW Steel has some watches like this. It's kind of U-boat ish. Uh, Welder Welder also is another brand that has a lot of watches that just look like this. A lot of horology and the watch industry is based on open sourcing the design. Once the patents expire, they're available for guys to use, for designers to use. And I think Ingersoll has fit in a nice little niche for themselves uh, whereby they're using Asian Chinese origin movements. Uh, Ingersoll specifically seems to be like, seems to me like they're targeting uh, seagull movements um, in uh, Asian watches that uh, kind of mirror over a lot of different style points from other uh, more expensive brands. And I'm totally okay with that. So anyhow, thanks guys for sitting through this review. This has been a watch box review of the Ingersoll Bison number no. 6 timepiece. I will catch you guys later. Thanks a lot.